My name is Stephanie LaRue. I am the Associate Director at CSREA, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. CSREA is an interdisciplinary hub that aims to build community with the public and among scholars and students working on race and ethnicity in and around the United States. Today's event entitled Black and Indigenous Resistance in the Americas from Multiculturalism to Racist Backlash is a two-part event featuring a panel of experts that have contributed to a newly edited, uh, a newly edited and published volume by the same name. The effort is the product of a multi-year transnational research project by the Anti-Racist Research and Action Network of the Americas. The volume charts the rise of racial recalcitrance and of anti-racist resistance in Black and Indigenous peoples in seven countries of the Americas, Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Guatemala, Mexico, and the United States. This presentation is a CSREA faculty grant event organized by Juliet Hooker, Professor of Political Science at Brown University. Please note that the book that is the focus of today's discussion is available to purchase conveniently via a link available through the chat function. We also hope that you will join us for the second panel of this event that begins promptly at 2 p.m. this afternoon through Zoom. CSREA also invites you to attend our other events. You can find more information on our website, www.brown.edu slash race. At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. Juliet Lewis, oh, sorry, Dr. Juliet Hooker to introduce our guests. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you to CSREA for hosting this event and for their, um, especially I wanna thank all the staff, including um, particularly Trey, Caitlin, for their wonderful work making this event happen. I want to say a little bit about the project before I introduce our panelists. Um, this and say a little bit about um, the, the volume as a whole. And before I begin that, I also want to acknowledge that, of course, we are in all the various places in which we are located and in which we're participating in this event. Um, uh, it, that this is indigenous land and so I want to take a moment to acknowledge indigenous dispossession as well as um, black dispossession and continued anti-black racism which are um, both formative for the volume that we um, that we can um, are happy to celebrate here but also our forces that shape our world wherever we are located this volume was the result of a deeply collaborative process which began um, not necessarily in the academy but as a collaboration between scholars and activists in multiple countries of the Americas as well as activist organizations and I would like to um, um, name the organizations that were in dialogue with us and helped us produce the research that's collected in the volume as their insights and their practices were central to the development of the um, the work that we're presenting here um, and they are the Comunidad de Historia Mapuche in, located in Chile, Copera in Mexico, the Observatorio del Racismo in Bolivia, the Observatorio del Racismo y Discriminación, uh, y Discriminación in um, Colombia and the Proceso de Comunidades Negras in Colombia, the Movement for Black Lives in the United States, Criola in Brazil, and the Observatorio de Racismo en los Medios en Guatemala. Um, this research took shape over many years and many meetings at various universities in the US and in Latin America. And the insights that um, we are presenting are, are definitely the result of collective reflection. Uh, but we need to thank in particular, there were many people who who were in dialogue with us and who helped organize activities were part of the, the research and the workshops that produced the volume who are not a part of the panel. And we wanna acknowledge that greater IR community that is, um, is, is really um, being honored here. Um, the activities that took place um, over the course of this research project were 
um, supported by various organizations whom I want to briefly acknowledge, um, including um, Brown University, the City University of New York, New York University, University of California, Santa Barbara, University of Texas at Austin, the Andrew Carnegie Foundation, the Winter Gren Foundation, the Inter-American Foundation, and the Latin American Studies Association. Um, so, as I said, we are absolutely delighted to be able to feature uh, many of the authors of the chapters in the edited volume, but before, but not all of them are here. And so I want to um, list those authors um, so that we know that they're all part of the volume. And the contributors to the volume were Jaime Antimil Canipan, Eliana Antonio Rosero, Pamela Calla, Rosbelinda Cárdenas, Rioberto Ashkalon Choi, Jacqueline Curaqueo Mariano, Eileen Ford, Jaime Garcia Leiva, Charles R. Hale, um, Charomina Rojas, Mariana Mora, Leith Mullings, Hector Nahuel Pan Moreno, Eduardo Restrepo, Luciani Ro Rocha, Irma Alicia Velasquez, Lima Tuj, and Howard Winant. Um, so the one of the things that I think is I want to spotlight about the volume is that it is really an attempt to reflect on the state of racial politics. And in particular, we began from this understanding that um, there had been a break in the expansion of that had been taking place over more than three decades of recognition of difference and collective rights for indigenous and black populations throughout the Americas. And drawing on collaborative activist research, which black and indigenous movements in Brazil, Bolivia, Guatemala, Colombia, Mexico, Chile, and the United States, the contributors to this volume argue that racial retrenchment did not come out of nowhere, that it's the result of contradictions and, trans and tensions already present during the era of expansion of anti-racist rights, that multiculturalism went hand in hand with a neoliberal e economic project that concentrated wealth in the hands of the few and threatened the health of the planet. Yet the reaction to it has paradoxically targeted racialized communities, such as Black and Indigenous movements struggling to preserve their lives and territories, immigrants, etc. Faced with resurgent racism, Black and Indigenous movements continue to resist, however, and drawing on their creative strategies of resistance, we argue that progressive anti-racist activism must center a critique of racial capitalism in order to su successfully confront white supremacy. Um, and so the volume was completed before the current round of racial, of, of anti-racist uprisings. And so um, we are, we see it both as a continuation of the trends that we identify, both of, of backlash, but also of resistance to that backlash. And I want to, um, uh, introduce our panelists today who are um, Mariana Mora, who is um, a professor of anthropology at the CSS Mexico, Luciani Rocha, who is an assistant professor at, of anthropology at Kennesaw State University, and Ilma Alicia Velasquez Nimatuj, who is a visiting professor at Stanford University. Um, before I turn things over to them, though, I, I have the, um, the sad duty of, of noting that we want to dedicate this event to a member of the um, of Rayar, who has recently passed away, Andres Calla, um, who was a co-founder of the Observatorio del Racismo in Bolivia. He was a sociologist and activist whose work focused on anti-racism, extractivism, and climate change. He was a researcher at the Centro de Estudios para el Desarrollo Laboral y Agrario. He was a dear father of Silvia and Lara. He and his partner, Cantuta Marucci, as well as their colleagues and sociology cohort in the Observatorio Boliviano became central to the foundation of Rayar. Um, Andres, we miss you and we dedicate this book launch to you. And I will now turn things over to Mariana Mora. Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Um, and I want to, to thank everyone at the center 
for the study of race and ethnicity in America at Brown for making this event possible. It's, uh, I'm very excited to be here with, with all of my colleagues and, and friends from, from that participated in the book and that are part of Rayar. Pamela Calla, who is part of, of Rayar and part of this book and, and is part of the team from Bolivia, asked uh, me to read something before I start um, that the Observatory on Racism in Bolivia wrote in dedication and in honor to Andres Calla, who, as Juliet mentioned, recently passed away. So I'm going to read this before I start. And they have sent the following message. The defeat of capitalist system won't be reached by overtaking the power or by means of police policies developed by the state. Rather, it will come as a product of disobeying the individualistic consumering logic. This is an excerpt from the last letter Andres wrote to some of us in the Observatorio de Racismo de Bolivia. During the pandemic, he took some time to return to some of his political and academic concerns that for him always were tied together. In his letter, he recalls Gandhi once again. We several times referred to him as Gandhi. It was Gandhi who inspired Andres since disobeying was his weapon of choice, a weapon that hurts no one but the power. This is one of the main features in Andres' way of acting. It is possible to defy the injustice and oppression and at the same time to recognize everyone's dignity. Never violent, yes, never, yet never passive. The quest was to change the world with generosity, determination, and avoiding the pursuit of state power, as well as revolutionary violence. For almost a, dec a decade, this ideas propelled his position in the Observatorio del Racismo. He brought this action in dialogue perspective and he remained hopeful when some of us felt hopeless. Some of us at the Observatorio were more academic while others were more activist, political, but we were always in what in Aymara we call Gamasa, that energy that ties things together, putting action and theory together. Now that Andres has, is gone, we kept his memory as a token to keeping on acting and thinking without negotiating principles, nor leaving the tenderness behind. Andres, we miss you and we are grateful for the time you walked along here. And, and I'm going to let Pamela, when she, when she presents in the next part panel, um, state what she wrote to Andres to make sure that in both of, of the panels, we are having him present. So um, with that introduction, that there's a lot of, of mourning in the times that we, we are living right now. Uh, and I think it's um, important to, to have that carry with us as we speak. Um, but keeping Andres in, in this space with us, uh, I'm going to be speaking about the chapter that I wrote with Jaime Garcia Leiva, who is an Asabi academic who teaches and does research in the region of La Montaña, which is uh, the, a primary indigenous and Afro-Mexican region, though the Afro-Mexicans in, in Guerrero are more on the coast. Uh, in, in Mexico. So we wrote a chapter that is um, entitled Racist Criminalization, Anti-Racist Pedagogies and Indigenous Teacher Descent in La Montaña Guerrero. And this research project, as Juliet said, had to do with a collaborative um, research agenda, right? The, and so that was carried forth through COPERA, the Collective to Eliminate uh, Racism in Mexico, of which I'm a part along with Kawasi uh, Siki, which is an indigenous and activist uh, teachers collective based in La Montaña de Guerrero. Um, and we decided to collaborate together on a series of workshops that Kawasi Siki was, was conducting at the time between 2014, 2016, uh, with the objective of, of reflecting on how to create a new curriculum based on indigenous epistemologies on Nasabi, MEPA and NAWA, indigenous epistemologies in La Montaña, uh, and at the same time, uh, push for uh, a, a different type of intercultural educational pedagogies um, at the local, state, and national level. And, and so I want to, to start by saying that because when we started to do this, the series of, of, of the intercultural and anti-racist workshops with Kawasi Siki, it was at a moment where um, Peña Nieto, the, the PRI president, was still in power. He was in power until 2018. And it was a moment where he was pushing an educational reform agenda 
that uh, was based roughly, I'm going to synthesize on standardized tests and on generating an increased precarious working conditions for teachers, um, both of which have detrimental implications for black and indigenous communities in Mexico. So at that moment, there was a dissident teachers union that's called La Cente. Um, and La Cente, which mobilizes primarily in indigenous states, so in the state of Oaxaca, of Guerrero, of Chiapas, uh, Oaxaca and in Guerrero also having a, a fairly large Afro-Mexican population. Um, it's, the, it's a dissident teachers union that mobilizes in those states. So they were pushing to try to get a reversal of that educational reform that um, Peña Nieto had, had implemented through a presidential decree. But Kawasisiki, who was working as part of La Cente, so they were part in all of these mobilizations and these marches, they were blocking roads, um, they were, had a, it was a very energized time. Um, they were saying a reversal of this educational reform is not enough. What we need to talk about is how to have an educational um, curriculum and, and pedagogies that are based on our own indigenous epistemologies, right? So, so the idea of these workshops was to generate um, an effervescence of, of political reflection and of collective um, knowledge production to push forth an agenda beyond that which La Cente was having. It's also at a time when, if you recall, it was around Ferguson, just to situate those that are, are listening from the United States, um, where there was a lot of, of um, police violence in, in, that was very visible in the United States. But at that time, there was also um, those indigenous, black, and peasant, um, and, and mestizo peasants that were teachers in training that were at the co Teachers College of Ayotzinapa were, um, were forcefully disappeared on the night of the 26th and 27th of September of 2006. So the, the anniversary is coming up shortly. Um, so at that moment, you had uh, a lot of repression against the teachers union, the dissident teachers union, and you're also having these massive, this, these waves of extreme violence um, perpetrated against, uh, against youth, uh, male youth in regions like La Montaña. Um, the, the most extreme of which was the forced disappearance of the 43 students of Ayotzinapa. So that was the moment we were doing research and, and we, were, we were trying to work through um, a puzzle, right? So if you think in Mexico, it's probably one of the states uh, in Latin America that, that refuses both at an, a state level and academic level and even within left circles, um, there's not much talk about racism, right? Uh, and not, certainly none of these events, the state repressive actions against La Cente in indigenous states, nor the forced disappearance of the students in Ayotzinapa, apparently were had any racist intention or racist motivation. But listening to the students from, the teachers from Kawasisiki and listening to the students from Ayotzinapa, listening to uh, at their, their, their subjective experience of, of living these events as, if a, as a reinforcement uh, that their lives are waste, that they are garbage, uh, que son basura, and, and that uh, they have been treated as criminals as if they were worse than narco traffickers. So if they were by default already excluded from the political community, they're certainly a racist and a racialized machinery that's underplayed. So, so what Jaime Garcia Leiva and I were trying to do within this workshop, within the series of workshops and the research that we conducted for this chapter, was then to see what's the racialized and the racist machinery that's underneath um, it, that renders permissible and justifies and continues to nourish and feed the type of, of events that we're witnessing that have to do with, with extreme levels of, of violence and, extreme, and, and state repression in regions like La Montaña. So I'm going to focus on, on three elements, that four, four elements briefly that we touched upon in our book, in our chapter, um, that I, the, and I want to highlight so as to put in dialogue with the other different cases and as part of a general reflection that I think we, is fundamental right now in academic and in activist settings in terms of what's the racist motor, racialized motor at play in the current moment. So the first is, is seeing this machinery at play um, forces us to revisit, as, as Juliet said in her introduction, forces us to revisit the past, right? Um, the recent past, the multicultural period. And what we realized in, in, in our re-excavation um, was that 
we as academics, and I think this is a general um, obstacle or blind spot that, that was shared amongst Mexican academics, that we focused a lot between the relationship between multicultural reforms that were taking place and neoliberal political economic policies, right? As two fundamental pillars of state formation during that particular era. But what we left um, to the sidelines and did not pay sufficient attention to was that at the same time that neoliberal policies were being implemented, at the same time as watered down multicultural reforms were being implemented, the state security apparatus was fundamentally being reconfigured. Um, and that that has fundamental implications for what we were to see later during the so-called undeclared war against organized crime that began in 2006 under Felipe Calderón, right? So, so doing this re-excavation of the multicultural period, we realized that, that the three uh, branches of government, both the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch implemented a series of reforms that they created a very robust security apparatus that had yet to have the criminal type that it was supposed to be acting against, right? Um, there was, it was the moment of zapatismo, so there was political dissent within that context. There was the narco trafficking or the criminal, criminal organizations were reconfiguring. So there was already potential criminals to be, um, to be created, right? As part of the justification for the robust um, security apparatus. But we wouldn't pay sufficient attention to it until it started hitting us in the face after 2006 with, uh, with Calderon and then later with the, during the presidential administration of Peña Nieto. So that's the first thing is I think that we need to revisit what we were looking at and what we weren't looking at during the multicultural neoliberal period uh, and see if there was perhaps other pillars of state formation um, that then became evident that were already being reconfigured in that particular moment. The second element that, that I want to, to present here for, for our discussion has to do with what that means in terms of biopolitical investment and biopolitical divestment um, on the part of the state, right? So if you have multiculturalism, you have neoliberalism, and you have the security apparatus all being reconfigured, then how does that um, play out in terms of the different types of investments, bioinvestments, and biodivestments that the state has? And, and what we, we located was that there's this profound divestment in, in aspirational capacities, as, as a part of I once stated, right? So in education, in health, in, um, that we know that that happens during the neoliberal period. But that was, fought, that was in a strict correl correlation to uh, a strong investment in the security apparatus. So just to give you a figure, between 2000 and 2012, while the funding for education increased in relative terms by 54%, the public security apparatus increased in funding by 334%, right? So you had this investment in, in the security apparatus, which, was, which then gets um, get materialized in people's everyday experiences. So you have um, students in Ayotzinapa, for example, um, they could try to be a teacher, but it was much easier to try to be a policeman or, or in the army. And several of the students that were disappeared had actually tried to become policemen or to be part of the army. Um, and then by default became teachers, right? So, so, in, in, so I think that, that that's part of the elements that, seem, that have an implicit racializing and racist effect, which is part of the arguments of this chapter. And, and that becomes visible because it generates, if you have an investment in the security apparatus, you need to create certain criminal types. And it generates a very, what we refer to as an implicit racist, racist anxiety on the part of the state. So that you end up having teachers that were dissident, in the dissident teachers union being treated as if not, they were narco traffickers, right? So indigenous um, teachers become treated as if they were by default going to be the utmost threat to the political community. And, and that's an effect, that's a racialized effect of these biopolitical investments and divestments. Um, the third point, and I'm going to, to go a little bit faster since I have four more minutes, um, was that this, this implicit racialized anxiety that has to do with these biopolitical investments and divestments uh, have lead to these bursts of explicit racism 
um, that, that were present uh, against the dissident teachers union because they started to equate, and especially on social media, la gente as the same as being Indian, a bunch of Indians. So you start to see the circulation of racist discourses that justifies and asks, asks the state to, to take repressive measures against the teachers through explicit racism, um, that they're a bunch of filthy Indians, that, that um, they, they are backwards in civilization, a series of tropes that are very familiar. Um, and the two of them are at play. So what we're trying to understand, and this is I pose for, for a reflection, in our chapter we're trying to figure out is what's the interplay between this implicit race, racial anxiety and these bursts of explicit racism um, through particular discourses that then materialize in police repression. Uh, how is that interplay uh, working out in this particular historical moment and what does that have to do with racialized formation? And so the last part of that I want to focus on is that um, if you see that that's what was happening in, in the moment we were conducting research, then what does alternative pedagogies, what do they have to do with potential anti-racist horizons and anti-racist actions, right? So uh, there it was, for us, it was very important in the anti-racist and, and, uh, and indigenous epistemology workshops that we had with Kawasi Siki was to see that uh, at the subjective level, the level of, of pain and the profound trauma that all of these events um, were, were sparking both in the immediate memory and in memories of long durée, right? And that there was a need then to produce collective knowledge that could name what, what these feelings were being, how they were being expressed onto the body through memories with, with ancestors, through um, other ex life experiences. And, and for that reason, uh, coming up with an alternative curriculum that is based on specific epistemologies, but that also is, is allowing uh, a collective naming of what these acts of state repression look like, um, becomes, takes, takes pedagogy uh, and, and the work of teachers into an anti-racist sphere of action. Uh, and so that was, that's something that we also touch upon as, as fundamental and that I think has forces us to rethink some of the uh, assertions that many of us have made where during the multicultural period, ed, the cultural reforms and especially intercultural education were more light in nature in comparison to what would be more profound reform of the state, say through the recognition of autonomy and self-determination. That when education as something that's being appropriated by the teachers and as part of this quest for alternative curriculum and pedagogies uh, is outside of the sphere of the state and becomes a place of naming, of working through trauma, of working through pain, and of coming up with a curriculum that allows that type of, of, of discussion and collective knowledge to be worked through along with the students and with the parents of the students in indigenous communities, that's a fundamental anti-racist horizon that plays a critical role in the historical times um, that we were under which we were conducting research. And so just to close, because I've, I've finished my 15 minutes, I want to say where we're at in the current moment. So, so first of all, uh, I want to recognize that, um, that we're in around the mid of the, of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, uh, left of center president, uh, so, uh, well, so he is called, uh, left of center president. But in this moment, and I think that this in, um, plays in dialogue with, with Luciani's research in Brazil, um, I think what we're witnessing is the level of intolerance of and, and, and underlying and explicit racisms um, of populist governments can unite the center left and the extreme right, which would be the case of Bolsonaro in Brazil. So what we're witnessing in, in Mexico is, um, is a, an intolerant um, political climate that, that situates indigenous and black communities um, within a type of reloaded mestizaje um, that is not allowing for dissent, it's not allowing for critique, it's not allowing for um, the, the blocking of state initiatives which continue to be centered on extractivist policies. 
Um, so, so even though there's a recognition of, of black communities in Mexico now and, and supposed constitutional reforms that will be most robust in nature for the collective rights of indigenous peoples, all of um, the, the administration is, is focusing on extractivist policies and on mega development projects as the, the motor behind the current administration. And that that is occurring alongside acts of extreme violence. So, so I think the question is in what are the continuities um, between the Calderon and the Peña Nieto administrations from 2006 to 2018 under uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador? And in what ways are these types of populist governments uniting left of center and extreme right forms of, of in, of intoleration and, and bordering on neo-fascism. I wouldn't say that that's the case of Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador's administration, but certainly intolerance is, and a lack of, of effective and substantial discussion around race and racism. So with that, I'll leave that, and, and thank you very much for listening to me. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I guess it's my turn to present it's nice to be here. I would like to start by thanking uh, Juliette Hooker and all the Brown community for organizing this book launch. Um, today I will be presenting the chapter Estamos em Marcha, Anti-Racism, Political Struggle and the Leadership of Brazilian Black Women. I'm here representing Criola and all the Black women that participated in the mar mar Marcha, in the March. Um, I also would like to start by honoring the memory of Andres. Let me show, I uh, forgot to show my PowerPoint, just a minute. So I would like also to honor the memory of Andres, um, who was a very good friend and researcher. And I also would like to acknowledge other members of HIAR. HIAR is not the only, it's not only the ones participating in, this, in these two panels happening today, but it's a collective of activists and scholars um, in the different countries um, uh, in this research. Okay. Um, I will, I will talk a little bit about the political context um, while we were conducting this research. So when this research project began, the political context in the Americas was one of the dominant center-left bloc in power throughout the region. Uh, this left-leading government, which included uh, Lula, Obama, Dilma as representative was uh, from, from, from historic, historically marginalized, marginalized groups and classes in these countries uh, and had transformed the political orientation and uh, profile of Latin America. Yet the question remained, uh, would this uh, rise of leftist government be enough to promote stru structural changes in these countries so in Brazil, for example, as a result of the activism by various black movements, especially black women, through mobilizations, lobbying, lobbying and articulation with government officials, various race conscious political uh, policies and, and government minister, minister were created. Yet the, uh, uh, these institutions face challenges and obstacles in the implementation of uh, legally maintained actions in favor of racial uh, equality, okay? So our researcher uh, questions um, related to this contest, uh, first we decide to uh, conduct a research analyzing the political action of of black women because we, we see black women as political activists uh, that um, work throughout the years uh, to uh, push for change in this society. And here I highlight the, um, the um, oh, by, uh, this group is uh, showing this picture, he's from Bahia, the um, um, Mulheres da Boa Morte. 
a, um, so we asked, uh, what led black women to hold the Marcha de Mulheres Negras, the Black Women's March, and invite the, the government and civil society to another civilizing anti-racist and anti-sexist pact in 2015? Our demand for rights is still the most effective strategy for anti-racist struggles. And what challenges uh, do the uh, political scenario um, uh, that fortified re reactionary groups pose to black women? Okay, so we asked uh, these uh, questions. About our methodology, our aim was to document the marcha, the Black Women's March, in the context of activism from our positionality as activist researchers. Um, as a way to contribute to collective national and interna international reflection about anti-racism, anti-racist activism. As black intellectuals, we agree with Patricia Hugh Collins when she argued that one role of black female intellectuals is to produce facts and theories about the black female experience that will clarify the black woman's standpoint for black for black women, okay? So we position ourselves as activists and also as researchers while uh, participating in the MASHA, articulating strategies and also conducting our research. Um, in this slide here, you can see um, uh, representation of uh, analysis of intellectual production uh, by black activists and researchers. Uh, and it's not intended to suggest that there, there uh, have been uh, separated waves of black women activism. This is just to show the continue and how our strategies um, um, uh, change uh, depending in the, in the context, in the, in the political scenario. So I divided uh, into Black women's activism into five phases or five, five, uh, four eras, uh, but it, they are uh, combined, okay? So first you can see here in the, nation, the nation, national context of the uh, Brazilian um, constitutional era from 1985 to 88, when the, the current Brazilian constitution uh, was uh, published and agreed. And then we have the first democratic era from 88 to 2001, where we could see the consolidation of constitutional rights in Brazil. The second democratic era from uh, 2001 to 2015, in this long period, we, we could see uh, state-led affirmative actions uh, pushed uh, by social movement and particular black women movement. And finally, this last era from 2015 to 2018, uh, which uh, we are calling here as third democratic era, uh, in which uh, we locate the COPE, uh, um, that um, uh, our uh, president Dilma Rousseff faced um, and also mark the dismantling of rights in, in, in Brazil. So we can see that black women are, uh, were collecting strategies from this period. In this first period, you can, we can see uh, several mobilizations and meetings organized by uh, black women in order to analyze the, the, the Con the contest, the political contest, and also to strategize so their demands uh, would be included in the Brazilian constitution. In the second, the first democratic era, we can see uh, 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 that they deepen this strategy and create forums, networks, marches, in black women institutes, and also several NGOs, including uh, the NGO Criola, in which I, I participate. 
And then the sec in the second demo democratic era, we can see the management of po uh, government policies. Uh, in this era, many uh, black representatives and black women were part of the government, including uh, minister, uh, uh, minister for Racial Equality, okay, uh, black women representing here. Uh, and in, now in the third democratic era, uh, as a strategy, we can see uh, black women as, as being candidates to, uh, in, in the political arena as recuperating, recuperating this strategy and also strengthening the, the political memory and political uh, uh, possibilities. I will talk about that um, uh, soon. So about the ethnography conducted, uh, uh, Black women organized uh, through in, in three different levels, the, the, the Black Women March. Uh, the first one and, 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 and biggest one was in the local arena, and then the state arena and the national arena. In the local, several meetings, thematic meetings. Um, in the state uh, arena, for forums. And in the national, the main one was the, uh, the actual march. Okay, and we can see uh, it's important to to uh, to understand that these uh, strategies of having representative in the national arena was more important to whom we were uh, interacting to the women um, themselves. Okay, so here are some also pictures from the uh, ethnography. One important part of this mobilization was. Uh, our participation during the carnival as a political act. We have an entire section represented by women from different Brazilian states and, and black women organizations. We held meetings, different meetings, and also we had a state march in Rio de Janeiro. Talking specifically about the teams in, in the march, uh, urban violence and incarceration was uh, 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 one team included in the manifesto that uh, that black women uh, uh, published to mobilize uh, for the march. So here you can see a picture of um, uh, I forgot her name. Sorry, ah, I forgot her name. But uh, and I'm I'm so sorry for that. But you can see here, uh, no, she was uh, one uh, mother from a favela in Rio de Janeiro, and she was brutally murdered, um, and her body was dragged, and and uh, by a police car. So this is a, repre a representation of our body being you know, receiving violence. And also uh, this other uh, picture here show uh, a woman who had ch uh, ch uh, children either killed or mutilated by, by police. I need to go faster because my time is up. Uh, another important theme um, during the Black Women's March was maternal mortality. And here you can see uh, Aline um, Pimentel, uh, uh, you know, who represent this struggle for equ equality and, and, and health in Brazil. And also one important theme during the march is the uh, rel religious racism that several Yalorishas faced. We can see nowadays several tejeros being burned and people uh, 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 receiving um, uh, uh, rocks turning you know, into their bodies in the streets of, of Brazil and specifically Rio de Janeiro. So uh, to, to, to conclude, I'd like to talk about the, the, the coup and how it changed our, our strategies. So here uh, in 2015, during the march, the, the Brazilian woman uh, um, went to a meeting with uh, Juma Rousseff the, the former president, and they uh, um, um, 
gave her a letter asking uh, the Brazilian government and also civil society to create another pact to include uh, uh, black women in, this, in political actions and also to overcome racism, sexism, and all forms of oppression, okay? What we could see was uh, a, a, a change and through the, the coup, we can see that the coup was against us, black women. This is a representation. Here you can see in the bottom, at the bottom, uh, the min, uh, uh, Dilma's minister, um, uh, ministers, and we can see one representation, one black woman representation here. At uh, in, uh, here in the bottom uh, left, we can see the minister for Temer. Uh, he didn't include any woman and any uh, black person. And now we have Bolsonaro, and we can see that we we can we we don't have interlocutors in these uh, governments anymore. About political possibilities and the strategies. Uh, in 2016, as an evaluation, uh, uh, we um, decide that we would have black candidacies. So several black women run for, for deputies and, uh, in, and in the local, local uh, uh, chamber as well. And Marielle Franco was one of the women elected and then she was uh, murdered in 2018. Uh, in this political context of showing black women's demand. Uh, so the political strategies that I could see while, in, while conducting the research was the return to grassroots awareness, strate strategic, strategic political alliances, uh, black candidacies, and also uh, this view that uh, uh, we are seeds, we are the ones that uh, build uh, uh, strategies and the main political actors uh, in Brazil. So I'd like to conclude uh, with a quote from Conceição Evaristo where she says that they agreed to kill us but we agreed to not die. Thank you very much and I'm sorry for the the lights. Thank you. Good morning. I want to thank the Center for the Study of Race and ethnicity in America at Brown University, and uh, my colleague, Juliet Hooker, for, organ for organizing this event. I make this presentation as part of a team made up of Rigoberto Choi, Aileen Ford, and myself, and myself who worked on chapter four that correspond to Guatemala. In this chapter, we analyze the consequences of official multiculturalism and the neoliberal regime on the economic and political lives of the Achi population of Rabinal and Cubulco, two municipalities located in the department of Baja de la Paz in Guatemala. These communities are notable because the leaders of local organization are also survivors of the internal armed conflict that officially lasted in Guatemala from 1960 to 1996. Despite the repercussions of this era of repression, survivors have attempted to rebuild their lives. In the beginning of the 1990s, at the dawn of the multicultural era, the achieved perceived convenient climate to advance their political agendas and a struggle for justice, racial equality, and the construction of cultural elements among other important considerations. Propelled by multiculturalism, they began to collectively mobilize to claim some of the rights, such as denouncing and demanding judgment of the material author of the massacres, rapes, and enforced disappearances that had taken place in the communities. This objective, the Achi used the legal framework created during the negotiation process that led to the 12 accords that formed the peace accords, reinforced by the signing of the final, final peace accord on December 1996 between the government and the Guatemala guerrilla, which formally ended the conflict. 
two key references points of this framework were Convention 169 regarding indigenous peoples of the Internal Labor Organization, with Guatemala ratified in 1996, and the Accord on the Identity and Right of Indigenous People, signed between the government and the guerrilla in 1995. Nevertheless, immediately after the peace agreements were signed, the Guatemalan state continued with its neoliberal agenda, privatizing public services and opening the country to national and transnational capital, while also promoting multicultural, multicultural policies that work as a governance platform to maintain internal armed conflict survival in permanent inequality. Methodology. In the field research of this chapter began in March of 2015 and ending in June 2017 in Rabinal and Kubulko. It is based on field work that included formal and informal interviews with 50 community leaders, male and female, indigenous professionals, merchants, Ladino, business people, academics, and state workers in the two municipalities. It, all, it also requires archival work and the consultation of state, national, and international reports and documents. In addition, studies of the region and legal documents related to trans transitional justice cases in Guatemala were reviewed, as were the Inter-American Court's rulings in the case of Achi communities, which were brought before this body by survivors due to the lack of justice within Guatemala. Finally, participant observation was a key part of, of our methodology. As a research and activist team, our experience in the region began in 2005, working with local organizations to support an investigative process that intended to bring to court those responsible for the crime of genocide against the Achi people. Since then, we have slowly built bonds of truth and collaboration with local actors returning to Rabinal and Kubulko to contribute to, to work to research for the recovery and documentation of achieved historical memory and another transitional justice court case propelled by survivors. About, uh, about the goal. In this chapter, we explore the current status and reach of the Achi people and the Achi people's collective rights and the factor that currently limit the recognition and fulfillment of their rights as indigenous people. Our study revolves around the following questions. First, what is the current status of the political, economic, and civil rights of the population in Rabinal and Kubulko? Second, what mechanism reforms social or racial stratification in these communities? And third, how do the official multicultural regime and neoliberalists reinforce their social stratification and contribute to the permanence of racial hierarchies? To answer this question, we analyze four interrelated issues. Guatemala multiculturalism and its paradoxes. Everyday experiences of racism and gender. Ladino identity and racial reaction to achieve demands and anti-racist resistance and its strategies and achievements. Through the chapter, we attempt to understand how each of these issues demonstrates 
multiculturalism limits and transformation in the Achi region as a reflection of overall trends in Guatemala. Our argument is that despite the creation of the multicultural policies after the peace accord were signed, the survival in Pubulco and Rabinal living condition of poverty and extreme poverty due to the fact that these policies have not altered the state's structural races. Our analysis suggests that this is clear to survival, which is why they have not focused their struggle exclusively on language, traditional clothing, or spiritual demands as prominent features, features of multiculturalism, but rather on the recognition of racial inequalities that led them to face acts of genocide. Simultaneously, they question development strategies driven by the elite and the state, such as the Chicxoy Dam, in order to try to alter the course of official politics in the communities. As we will show, this research for alternative paths encompasses the recognition of ancestral Achi authorities political power in the municipalities of Garinal and Cubulco, the creation of non-profit organizations to address residents, to address residents' socioeconomic and, and legal needs, widen education, educational opportunities through the creation of the Center for the Formation of Rural and Urban Leaders, linguistic studies about the Achi language and scholarships for students. The creation of entrepreneurial and resource conservation projects within their own cultural frameworks and negotiation process and pressure so that the Guatemalan state will take responsibility for having executed crimes against humanity against the Achi during the armed conflicts. In general, we consider that Guatemalan multiculturalism was the result of at least two processes. On the one hand, it was a state response to the demands put forward nationally by the resistance movements and long-standing struggles of indigenous people in the response to the exclusionary projects of cultural assimilation of past centuries. When there was a push to have them homogeneously embrace the nation and accept a form of citizenship that obscured inequalities behind a veneer of diversity. On the other hand, Various groups have argued that multiculturalism was an elite game plan to modify and break apart indigenous struggles. In this context, multiculturalism expressed itself in the creation of state agencies, Pentanias indigenous, indigenous gateways, that during this research, were on the side lines of government operation were never core institution worked in clientelist way and possessed few resources for the operation, most of which came from international donations. Although some of, some of them might have begun their work with the intention of creating change. Example included the Academia of Maya Languages of Guatemala, the Advocate Office for Indigenous Women, and the Presidential Commission Against Discrimination and Races. The multicultural project cleared a space in a contradictory manner for the emergence of a new form of neoliberal governance that simultaneously articulates 
the recognition of indigenous rights and identities, while in parallel bringing about a wave, a wave of neoliberal reforms that perpetuate the economic and political margin, 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 marginalization of indigenous peoples. At the same time, it excluded or attacks political identities and mobilization that defy structural racism, historical colonialism, and the free circulation of capital. Analyzing the Achi case, it becomes clear that multiculturalism has not generated transformation aimed at generating profound structural equality because it was never really designed to do that. Although it encouraged an inclusive discourse and the recognition of indigenous people's rights, multiculturalism has coexisted with the denial and violation of the economic, political, and civil rights of these same people. Simultaneously, indigenous anti-racist resistant efforts question that the status quo and struggles to build more just alternatives. While the survivors of the armed conflict were able to use some of these spaces created by multiculturalists after the signing of the peace accord to launch their demands for, for transitional justice nationally, nationally and internationally. It was a slight opening which nevertheless allowed war traumas and past sexual violence to be faced. Regarding economic rights, however, multicultural policies have changed very little because the survivors living conditions in these two municipalities are marked by poverty and extreme poverty. This is not surprising, given that multicultural policies were not created to modify the structural races on the Guatemalan states. Indeed, in Rabinal and Kubulko, the type of multiculturalism we identify is that which recognize, recognizes a specific indigenous rights, but only when those when those rights, whatever they may be, do not intimidate the political and economic interest of dominant sectors locally and nationally. Another characteristic of this moment in these two municipalities, product of multiculturalism, is the deepening of community divisions, while simultaneously the same multicultural, multiculturalism discursively promotes collective projects of national unity around extractive investments, such as discourses fun function to conceal the fact that the state and private companies through the repressive forces have used harassment, criminalization, and violence against the integrity and, dig and dignity of indigenous people who oppose their development plans based on mega projects and who are simply defending the rights. It is a brutal offensive against indigenous leadership and social movement. Más tarde te, te, te muestro lo que envió un email diciendo que si la habíamos sacado del grupo, que si había sido por el último email que me había mandado a mí. It is a brutal offensive against indigenous leadership on, and social movement that has reached such extreme levels that the Chile leaders have received death threats and sought as asylum abroad. This demonstrates that the struggle for justice also entails risking one's life in the process. Nevertheless, despite the setbacks and challenges, we can glimpse in the region a context where a chi actor have tools many acquired during the multicultural period, with which 
they will continue to foster social, political, and economic change and to bring up long-term forms of resistance that will endure. This resistance effort will carry on because they do not they don't not depend on the growth, empty promises, or false rights of multiculturalists, but rather they are projects for a different kind of country, one where life in all its forms together with human dig dignity can prevail. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Irma, Luciani, and Mariana for presenting your work and um, your analysis of where we are um, in, and where we have been in terms of Black and Indigenous rights and resistance in um, Mexico, Colombia, I mean, Mexico, Brazil, and, and Guatemala. We have a number of questions. Um, and so I'm going to begin um, asking those. Um, so one question that we got um, for you, Mariana, was how is the investment and expansion from Luis Sanchez Lopez is, how is the investment and expansion of the Mexican repressive apparatus linked to what some scholars have referred to as the growing authoritarianism in the United States or the authoritarian turn in the United States. Um, some, uh, Roxana Curiel also asked to know more about what you mean by reloaded mestizaje and how indigenous and black communities are portrayed in that narrative. Uh, for Luciani, I'm just going to go through and, and, and read the questions we have and then you all can answer. How do you see, Luciani, the internal differences and challenges for organization within the Black women's movements themselves, for example, during the preparation of the Black Women's March and between Forum Nacional and AMNB, but also the more subtle differences in vocabularies and strategies we see among different generations of Black women activists in Brazil? In your opinion, what is the role of race and gender violence in the current political backlash in Brazil? That's a question from Julia Abdala. Um, and another question for Luciani is how do you keep, um, well, this is a broader question about challenges for black and indigenous women. How do you keep the movements active in the black women's groups when they're being murdered? Why is there no solidarity with the other groups allyship? That's from Sonia Brooke. Um, and another question for Mariana is, if your research captures attempts at solidarity within the different populations that historically comprise the SNT, for example, um, it has a broad membership um, where class, in Mexican society where class, characterized by the low status of the teaching profession and race, have intersected in meaningful ways, how are these different groups mobilized in relation to the marginalizing discourses and practices described. And in terms of the bureaucratic reconfiguration of the teaching profession in Mexico, um, how do you understand this in relation to the marginalization of the SNT members? Um, and this has to do, for example, um, the increasing qualifications for the teaching profession from normalistas to licenciados en educación. Um, how does the enhanced status of the profession play out in bio disinvestment of the state? That's from Laura Lopez Sanders, my colleague in sociology here at Brown. And I have a question from Irma from Tata, who is also um, involved in, in helping us um, bring this volume together. Tata Sagasan Rabindran. How does multiculturalism deepen existing community divisions in Guatemala? And um, a, a question that I think um, for everyone from Maley Blackwell, um, that the asking how, if you can all speak to how the rise of gendered violence is tied to racialized state repression. So I'm gonna, that, that's a lot on the table for you to answer. So um, uh, Luciani, if you're ready, do you wanna go ahead? 
Yes, thank you. Thank you for the questions. So first I would like to give some names that I forgot uh, while I was presenting. First, uh, I showed you a picture from the Irmandade da Boa Morte, Boa Morte Sisterhood, uh, a group of um, elderly women in Reconcov uh, da Bahia. And also I forgot uh, the name of Claudia Ferreira Silva, the woman who were murdered uh, in, in Rio's favela, in a, in a Rio's favela. Uh, I got lost here between two screens and two programs and chat, and sorry for that. Okay, so to answer the questions, first I would like to highlight another uh, uh, point that is informative to answer the question. Um, the fir uh, first uh, is uh, uh, through the Brazilian Constitution of 1988, um, uh, all uh, 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 people in Brazil, people from the different races, uh, got their rights secured, okay? But it, it didn't mean that uh, we would assess this right. So the Black women's uh, struggles throughout this year was to, uh, to consolidate these rights secured in the Brazilian constitution, okay? So while mobilizing through the, um, through the march that happened, happened in 1915, we could see the uh, diversity and the, uh, the combination of various groups, uh, women's groups uh, organized through uh, NGOs, forums, collectives, organizing the march. So the, to answer the question about the internal difficulties among women and specifically among the IMNB and Forum de Mulheres Negras, uh, one thing that was very important during this mobilization is the call that the march is, uh, uh, belongs to everyone, to every woman. So there was a strategy of not uh, having one specific NGO or one specific public figure representing the march. So in terms of uh, research and positionality, it was a struggle for, uh, for me and, and, and Jurema also who was, who was part of the research to, uh, uh, to create our positionality during that. So I was asked several times, so is this research for, for Criola? Who, who will publish this? So whose name is going to be there? You know, because um, uh, there was this tension about uh, who will create the political and intellectual material about the march. So that's why we position ourselves as activists and uh, and uh, and uh, scholars working together along with the women in order to produce this material uh, with them, okay, and not speaking uh, for them. Uh, so yeah, so we could see tensions, but this uh, uh, collective um, will to um, to spread the knowledge and the the outcomes to everyone. Uh, so how do you keep the group motivated while uh, someone has been killed? Well, black people has been killed since you know, the beginning of this African diaspora. So, um, and also we can see our resistance throughout the years. So we are, we are formed as political subject as resisting to massive violence uh, and towards the black body and specifically towards the black woman's body. Um, uh, so it is important to us to not, um, uh, so it, it's very important in this contest, our uh, mo motivation. We motivate looking through the, through, uh, looking to the uh, uh, other generations and the struggles uh, black women face in the past and also trying to protect the next generations, okay? So we see ourselves in this role of protecting the next generation and being enlightened by the previous one. Thank you. Mariana, do you wanna answer next? 
Yes, I can answer next. Um, there's a lot of questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I don't think we're going to have time to cover them very thoroughly. But let's see. Uh, I'm going to try to answer them by grouping them a bit together. In terms of the, the Mestizaje Reloaded, I, I, would, I would just, um, in, uh, of the current administration, I would invite anyone who's interested to see uh, a mural of Diego Rivera, right? So you can look, say, the one of Parque Alameda um, and put that next to the image of the inauguration, the uh, taking of, of power of, of Manuel, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, the, the day that he took um, the presidency in, in the Zócalo, so in the main plaza. So it was him and his wife, and, and then in the background, um, different representatives and of indigenous peoples, and, and for the first time, and I must say that that's important, Afro-Mexican populations. Um, but it, they were all in the background while they're in the center as the, the president that, that's um, surrounded by, by the representatives of the roots of, of the history of the foundation of Mexico. So I, I take those images and, you, and it looks very similar like the Diego Rivera painting, <laughs> which is sort of what epitomizes um, the Mestizaje ideal in the post-revolutionary period. So that just in terms of representation, but in terms of very concrete things, there is things that have mobilized in terms of there's, um, there's uh, Afro-Mexican populations, which is the, the term that has been decided to be used for black communities, primarily in Guerrero, Oaxaca, and Veracruz. Um, they're, they're now recognized in the constitution, so I think that's important. Um, there's supposed to be a, a reformulation of constitutional reforms on indigenous collective rights. Um, but what we're seeing, but that is insufficient because what we're seeing is that indigenous, um, indigenous leadership, indigenous representation, and certain indigenous rights are being refolded into a state project, but there's not a questioning of what that project is made of, right? So, so what you see on the other hand is why, while there's this um, discursive play of, of recognition, um, there's a, uh, the, 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 the policies that continue to gender indigenous and black peoples in Mexico irrelevant for the state or, or as part of this eliminatory principle of the state, if you're to think of settler colonialism, that is, is, is being um, in place. During the pandemic, one of the essential um, industries or economics is mining. So that was never stopped during the pandemic, right? Um, while the, the current administration did revoke the educational reform, it refused to revoke other reforms that are central, the mining law, the water law, hydrocarbon laws, all of those that have devastating environmental and social and cultural impacts as Irma Alicia pointed out in her presentation for, for indigenous and Afro-Mexican communities. So that goes and the mega development projects go. So the Tren Maya, this um, mega development project that will have be a tourist train that will go through most of the Mayan region um, goes even with, through a false consultation that was so false in, in its inability to recognize or to respect the terms of consultation as established in international law um, it was refuted in, by the, the UN and Lopez Obrador refused to, to recognize that the UN was saying this consultation was not, is not correct. So that's just sort of the terms. And then, and then I think, in, and, and this is getting at another question, um, the way that, I mean, after Colombia, according to human rights defenders, after Colombia, Mexican ha Mexico has the highest level of of environmental human rights defenders that have been assassinated in the past years in, in Latin America, right? Uh, and most of those are indigenous and in some cases are Afro-Mexican as well. So, so uh, you need to see the way that this repression is playing itself out on the ground of those that are, that are struggling against these extractivist policies and what are the imp real impact in the people's lives. Um, in terms of this authoritarian turn, uh, I would, I just, I have a question that I don't have an answer to, but I'm, I'm going to answer the question by throwing it back in terms of another question is, uh, the what is it about the current moment that left of center presidents or, or people, authorities in power are, are exacerbating and are demonstrating the same level of intolerance of extreme right? So I think the way that that can be reflected is the way, say the New York Times has been um, covering the way that Bolsonaro, Trump, and Lopez Obrador have, enacted, have responded. I think that there's a microphone that's on. 
have responded to the pandemic in very similar sorts of ways, right? A negation that there's a problem uh, and just a stubbornness of we're going to move forward with my pre-described plans, regardless of whether they're viable in this moment or not, and of eliminating the types of racialized vulnerabilities that a large section of the populations are, 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 are living and as a consequence dying from. So I would, and I think that that's just a question to reflect on. Um, and then I think I'm, I'm out of time to think of, of the, but I do think that I, what I wanted to, to highlight is that there's this, um, I think the anti-police violence and, and uh, anti-white supremacy mobilizations in the United States have been, have been very contagious on this side of the border. So there's, there's a new discussions about racism and police brutality that has been largely silenced or have been in very low level um, denunci denunciations in, in the past decade. So I think that that's something that um, to, to pay attention to. And then I think the answer of La Sente is a lot of, uh, there's a lot to say there, but I don't think I have enough time. I, in, but I do, um, but then in terms of uh, Meili's question on the rise of gendered violence that's tied to state repression, I think that the, the, what we've been seeing in the past years in terms of the levels of feminicide and the forced disappearance, forced disappearance being mainly, though not exclusively, focused on youth males, um, and it's differential that forced disappearance for women usually has to do with human trafficking and, and youth males, um, something for uh, other reasons. Um, but I think that there's a, a gendered uh, analysis would, would have us be focusing on what's the, what's the production of the disposability of racialized masculinities happening as part of this machinery. And in what ways um, does that then uh, tie in back to the effects that it has of the women, of the family members of those disappeared? And in what ways is this disposability of racialized masculinity um, generate a type of compensation on the part of those males that sometimes gets enacted through a, a retrenchment of domestic violence and of other forms of violence on their women counterparts. So I think that that's, uh, and the relationship between the two, I think is something that we need to really put a lot of attention to. Thank you. Great, thank you both Mariana and Luciani. Irma, do you want to jump in and? Okay, um, about the question, Thank you for the question about the multiculturalism and the division in the, in the communities. I will uh, give you some of the examples of this division and how this division works. Uh, for example, the communities are divided with the introduction of the mega projects in the communities. The companies, uh, when they arrive to the communities, uh, give jobs to some members of the communities with very, very low wages. But as the communities are living in poverty, they end up defending the companies. So this is, this is one example. Another example is um, the government, the national government, the president or the ministers uh, give some position to some indigenous leaders women and men, indigenous from different communities, where they don't have uh, much responsibilities and uh, they end up defending the neoliberal governments. And uh, in, in the, uh, when they do this, they are against their own communities. In other words, the multiculturalism uses, uses the indigenous people, uh, women and men, only for the forum. Uh, other example is um, the social programs. The government in Guatemala has a lot of social programs for, for especially for indigenous people, for women, for children, for communities. So the government use uh, the social programs uh, for, in order to divide the communities. The people that, that are with the government, they receive uh, these social problems and the people that confront or speak up against the government, they don't receive the social problems. So this is another um, problem and another division is 
provoke another division inside the communities, inside also inside the families. And uh, the last example that I will uh, share with you is uh, uh, the survivor of the, the struggle of the survivor of the armed conflict. They, 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 they have a very long uh, uh, struggle for, for justice in Guatemala, but uh, the, the states use the same institution that are in the communities in order to sabotage the survivors. So this is another form that uh, the division, and we can find many, many different uh, uh, examples and forms. I think the, the um, government in countries like Guatemala, where the majority of the population uh, is indigenous, they have more um, elements to divide the communities because the majority of those communities live under poverty or extreme poverty. And the majority need the jobs, the majority uh, live in, in, in uh, very rural communities and depend on the, on the government in, in, in different ways um, and also in very important areas, for example, health, for example, education, for example, road. So uh, this, is, this is one of the examples that I can share with, with you. Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you um, to all of our panelists. This book has been um, a labor of love, and we look forward to seeing you um, at the second panel this afternoon at, um, uh, at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, Luciani, Mariana, and Irma for sharing your research with us. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you, Mariana and Luciani. Thank you, Irma. Nice to see you. <laughs>